I've shot hundreds of these episodes. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Hello, I'm Marshall Brown. Welcome to another episode of Marshall Brown Presents Neat Names of God with Marshall Brown. <laughs> I'm very excited about today's episode. We're going to be talking about the name of God, Yahweh Rofi, which means the Lord my healer or the Lord who heals. I'm also very excited because my friend Brandon brought a special guest with him today, an actual doctor. And this doctor is going to talk about what it means to heal people. Where's our special guest, Brandon? I, uh, didn't, get, I didn't get a doctor. You don't, we don't have a special guest? There's, there's no doctor. There's no... I'm, I'm sorry. No Dr. Jekyll? No. Dr. Phil? No. Dr. Pepper? No. Dr. Who? No. Dr. No? No. Dr. Strange? No. Dr. J? No. I don't know what to do right now. It's still pretty neat. So there's that. All right. We've been talking about naming God. And I appreciate Mike's uh, thoughts this morning, just talking about how important this is, how special it is that we're, we're talking about these different names of God that you find in Scripture. The, the words that we have translated in English, what those original words or original names were in their original languages and what that means for us nowadays. And we've also discovered not only what these names are, but discovered something about God because of the names uh, that he is revealed by. There's something that, that we get to see about him, a character trait that we get to celebrate or, or be mindful of, uh, maybe even be made aware of for the first time. So we've been talking about these different uh, names of God uh, throughout Scripture, mostly in the Old Testament. And one of the names that we talked about was Elohim, the, the creator God, the God above all gods. And we reminded ourselves that God needs to be above all other things in our own lives. We talked about Yahweh, the, the name that God said, I want my people to know me by this name, uh, especially uh, with, with the, the Hebrews back in the Old Testament, and saying that, you know, that, that name just means the one who is, that God is active, he is present, he is constant, he is always uh, in our lives and a part of our lives. We, we talked about the name El Shaddai, God Almighty, and talked about you know, God being always uh, consistent like a mountain, he keeps his promises. He keeps his word. He, he stays true to who he is, and he stays true to what he says that he's going to do. We talked about El Royi, the God who sees. The God sees what's going on in our lives and sees the things that we're doing and that we're a part of and sees the things that are happening to us that we may not, may not have any control over and how God is constantly aware of where we are in our lives and who we are in our lives, and he recognizes what our needs are, and he, and he meets those needs. We talked last week about Yahweh Nisi, the Lord my banner. And we talked about wearing the name of God and being the people of God and, and God being the one that, that we give our allegiance to, the one that leads us forward in this life, the one who gives us the victory and gives us victory today through the cross. And we've talked about all these different names and, and I've appreciated the feedback that, that, that you've given and I hope that this has been something beneficial, not just for you, but that you've been able to share maybe with some other folks as well. We're going to continue with another name today. We're going to focus on another name of God and that is the name Yahweh Rofi. Now, I, there's about four different ways to say this name from what I could discover when I looked it up on the Google. And so... I'm, I'm used to saying Rofi. You could say Rafe. You could say Rofe. You could say Rafa. There's a lot of different pronunciations of this particular Hebrew word. So if I say it a couple of different ways, know that I'm still talking about the same word, okay? Uh, there's multiple ways that, that different people say it. But Yahweh Rofi, the, what, what does that name mean? Now we know we just talked about Yahweh, the God who is. The God who is present, the God who is active, the God who always is. And then Rophi or Rafe is the Hebrew word for, for uh, healing, to heal or a healer. 
And so this name literally means, Yahweh Rophi means the Lord who heals. Now, this word Rophi is used several times, lots of times throughout Scripture when, when talking about uh, someone being healed or wanting to be healed. As a matter of fact, uh, God is referred to probably at least 60 times in the Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible, uh, as being a healer. This word is used to refer to him as being the one who heals or a healer. But the name, Yahweh Rophi, there's only one time that it's mentioned. There's only one time that it's used specifically that name applied to God in Scripture. But there's something powerful about this name. There's something that, that we're going to see about God and his healing power and how how he demonstrated that with his people uh, over the centuries. Now he continues to be our healer today. But I want, to, I want you to see where it was first used, where this name was applied to God. So if you got your Bibles with you or your Bible apps, go to Exodus chapter 15. Second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus chapter 15. To give you a little bit of a background to the story, the book of Exodus talks about the people of God being set free from Egyptian slavery. They had been enslaved in the nation of Egypt for 400 plus years. And God uh, rescued them using Moses as their leader. He rescued his people from Egyptian slavery. And part of the process of doing that, maybe you've read the story before. If you grew up in church, you might have seen it, uh, seen the story, you know, put up on flannel graphs or watched a video of it. Uh, if you've ever watched... Uh, you know, Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments. There's, there's a part of the story there, okay? Uh, but, but it's a story of God freeing his people. In the process of doing that, he inflicted a bunch of plagues on the nation of Egypt. Water turning to blood. There's flies. There's frogs. There's livestock dying. There's darkness. There's hail. There's locusts. There's all these different things that happen. And the final thing that he does is he allows the firstborn male children of the nation of Egypt to be killed, to die. And Pharaoh is so upset by this because, because his own child dies. And he's so bothered by this that, that he uh, calls Moses in and he tells Moses, get those people out of here. I'm done with you guys. I'm done with your God. Get out. And they pack up their things and they go. And there's hundreds of thousands of Hebrews now walking towards the Red Sea. And they get to the Red Sea and Pharaoh has a change of heart. And he decides, you know what? We just lost our slave labor. We don't want to have to do this work on our own. What are we going to do? Let's go get them. So he sends the army after him to go get the Hebrews and bring them back. And now the Hebrews are trapped. They got the Red Sea in front of them. They got Pharaoh's army behind them. And God comes in and, and uh, performs a miracle and parts the waters of the Red Sea. And his people walk across on dry ground. And Pharaoh's army is still in pursuit. And when the people get across uh, the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is chasing after them, God causes the waters to come back and Pharaoh's army is destroyed. And you get to chapter 15 and the people of God are celebrating their freedom and celebrating the destruction of the Egyptian army. And there's this whole song uh, that Moses sings. And then you read a little bit after that, Moses' Mir Moses' sister Miriam gets a bunch of other women together and they dance around and sing. It is a celebratory time. People are, are just cheering and, and thanking God and celebrating. It's amazing. And they head on down, uh, head on down the road towards the promised land, the land that God said he was going to give to them. And after three days, three days, they come to some water and they don't like the taste of it. Bible says that it's bitter. What that means, I don't exactly know. Did it just taste bad? Was it unhealthy? Was it poisonous? We don't know for sure. We just know they don't like the water. They can't drink it or won't drink it at least. And they're complaining to, to Moses about it. And Moses goes and he takes this, this piece of wood and he throws it at the, at the head of the spring and it cures the water. The water is drinkable now. And there's part of this that, that you look at with the people of God and go, do you, <clears throat> do you realize you've just been set free from 400 years of slavery? Do you realize that God just decimated one of the most powerful kingdoms in the world at this time? Do you realize that God worked a miracle so that the laws of nature were bent and, and had to bow to his power so that you could walk across on dry ground and that he collapsed that water on the army that was following you. He saved you. He rescued you. And how long did it take you to forget that God is looking out for you? Three days. We don't like the water. 
we should go back where we were. Are you kidding? And there's part of me that looks at the Israelites and goes, how in the world? <clears throat> but I know me. I'd probably be complaining about the water too. After God fixes the water for him, we find the name revealed. So I want you to look at verse 26 of Exodus chapter 15. Look along with me. If you don't have it, it'll be up on the screen. God's talking to his people, and he says, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the, on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And if you go back to the original ancient Hebrew this is written in, he would say, I am Yahweh Rophi. I am the Lord who heals. That's where we find the name. That's where God reveals this, this part of his character, this part of who he is. And he says, you know, I could be the destroyer. I could be the, the inflictor of horrible things. I could do all that, but I don't want to do that. I want to be, and I am, the God who heals. Stick with me, follow me, be my people, be the kind of people that I've set you free to be, because I am the Lord who heals. I'm the Lord who makes things better. I'm the Lord who, who gives life, not takes it away. I'm the one who, who has rescued you. And when you do mess up, when you do fall short, when things do go bad, I'm the one that can fix that. I'm the Lord who heals. God promises his people, I'm going to go with you through the wilderness. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep from doing the things to you that I did to the Egyptians. And I... When you need me to, I'm going to heal you because that's who I am. That's what I do. Folks, I firmly believe with all of my heart that we still serve a God who heals, that his name is still Yahweh Rofi, that we need to be healed and we have a God who can do it. So then the question becomes, well, okay, what is it, what is it that he can heal? Explain that to me. What is it that God heals? Well, there are several things. We could probably come up with a whole list of different things. I'll give you a, a few of, of the things that I think we share in common that God uh, can heal for us. One is God can heal my physical body. God can heal me physically. The psalmist says in Psalms 103, verses 2 and 3, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals, that's that word, Rofi, he heals all your diseases. I believe that God can physically heal me, that he can heal diseases and sicknesses and hurts and pains that are causing me problems. I believe that when you look through scripture, when you read through the Bible and you see stories of healing taking place, that those aren't just make-believe, those aren't just fables and legends, that those things actually happen, that God really did heal those people and that those things are still happening nowadays. And sometimes we get nervous Maybe just within, you know, our denomination, maybe just within our, our family or our, our upbringing, we get a little anxious when we talk about God healing us physically. And we, we, kind of, we kind of pray for it. I mean, we know people are in the hospital, and we say, well, I'm going to be praying for you. And we kind of, even if we're sick, we kind of pray for ourselves, Lord, heal me. But there's part of us is like, mm, that, that almost seems kind of weird. I've seen, too many, I've seen too many TV shows with the televangelists and the faith healers who are exploiting people's belief in healing, who are exploiting people's faith. And, and I don't want to be grouped into that. Or we find ourselves saying, well, I've prayed for healing before and it didn't happen. And so I might say I'm going to pray for it nowadays, but I'm really not for sure. Folks, I'm convinced God still heals. God still, still heals us. That when we ask him for it, that he'll actually do it. There's too many times throughout scripture that you see people asking for healing and God does it. There's a story in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 20, where a king named Hezekiah has a disease and he goes home and he prays to God and he says, God, I just, I just want to be healed. I just want more years. And God does it. You read, I mean, there's so many stories of Jesus healing people in scripture. A Jesus healing blindness and, and people who are lame. A Jesus casting out demons. I don't think those are just stories. I think Jesus really did that. And too many times in my own life, 
I've asked for healing for myself, for people that I care about, and God's done it. And you can say, well, it's medicine and it's treatment and those, all those kinds of things. Fine, God can use those things, but I believe I have experienced in my life healing that took place without any medicine. I believe it. I know it. And I know there's times when we can honestly say, well, God didn't heal. I asked for healing and it didn't take place. That happened in Scripture too. King David had a small baby that he spent a week laying flat on his face on the floor begging God for the life of that child, and God didn't save him. There's a story of a man named Lazarus. And Lazarus, is family, Lazarus gets sick, and, and Lazarus' family sends word to Jesus. Jesus, come quick because your friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus doesn't even go, and Lazarus dies. I mean, Jesus had the opportunity. As a matter of fact, Jesus shows up later, and Lazarus' family says, if you'd have been here, you wouldn't have died. It's true. But he didn't come. The Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians says, I prayed to God, I begged God three different times to take away a thing that was bothering me. And the answer was no. You're all right. I've prayed for people I, I love to be healed and God didn't do it. And I, I, I don't want to depress us or worry us I want to be honest. I believe with all of my heart in the God who heals, who has the power to heal, even when sometimes he doesn't. But even if, even if God doesn't heal in certain circumstances for whatever reason, that does not diminish the fact that he can heal and that he continues to heal. And I think we need to be in the habit of praying for it and asking for it and believing and trusting in the God who still heals our physical bodies. But God doesn't, also, doesn't only just heal my physical body, He can heal my relationships as well. He can heal my relationships. My God can heal marriages that are on life support, that are, that are broken and falling apart because of distrust, because of lack of communication, because of a porn addiction, because of an affair, because we're just not spending time together anymore. My God can heal that. He can heal broken relationships between kids and their parents and parents and their kids. He can heal broken relationships between siblings who haven't talked to each other in years. My God can fix that. My God can heal friendships that have been ruined because of hurtful words and gossip. My God can heal church connections that have crumbled because of judgment and, and, and racism and bitterness. My God can fix that. He can heal it because my God is the God who heals. He heals anything. He can heal everything, including my broken relationships. Psalm chapter 147, verse 3 says, He heals. That's that word again, rofi. He heals the brokenhearted. And binds up their wounds. My God can heal whatever is broken, even when I believe it's beyond repair. God can heal my physical body. He can heal my relationships. He can heal my sin. My God can heal my sin. This church family knows earlier this year, back at the end of the month of January, I went on a trip to um, uh, India with my friend Kurt Picker and his wife. And Paul Curry, too. Kurt was telling me a story about one time when, when he was there in India and they had taken a bunch of supplies, a bunch of uh, rice and oil and blankets and pillows to a leper colony. And they had distributed all these goods to these lepers who couldn't provide these things for themselves. And they had given it to them and, and had shared with them and prayed with them. And everybody uh, was still kind of sitting around and waiting. And, and Kurt asked the preacher he's with, he's like, what's everybody waiting for? We're done. And, and he says, um, they're waiting for, you to, waiting for you to preach. And he's like, and I didn't have anything ready. What do, you, what do you say to a bunch of lepers? What do you say as a healthy white male from America to a bunch of Indians with missing digits? He said, the only thing that I could say was what was on my heart. And that was, we all have a disease. 
We all have a disease. It's called sin. I have it. You have it. But we also have a God who heals. Isn't that awesome? We have a God who heals our sin. Sin is a sickness. It's, it's a disease. It, it creeps into our hearts. It, it corrupts our souls. It infects our relationships. It controls our choices. It weakens our faith. It separates us from the only one who can rescue us from it. And that's what he does. He rescues us from our sin. He forgives it. He gets rid of it. He heals the damage that's been done because of it. And he does this through his son, Jesus. Almighty God sent his perfect son, Jesus, to this earth to be a sacrifice for my sin, for the disease that was crippling my faith and corrupting my heart. My God sent his son to die for my sin. And if I trust in that, and if I believe that he was raised again after three days, and if I, if I commit to him and ask him to be the king of my heart and the king of my life, if I repent of those sins, if I am covered in, in the blood of Jesus through baptism, I have forgiveness, I have freedom, I am healed of my sin. The punishment that Jesus went through, the, the humiliation he endured, the pain he suffered, the death he experienced, all those things were meant for me because of my sin. I suffer from a sickness called sin, and I can't do anything about it. I can't buy myself away from it. I can't do enough good to offset it. I can't erase it from my history. I can't, I can't wipe my own slate clean I can't heal myself from my sin only he can and he's done it through Jesus and that's awesome my God can heal my physical body he can heal my relationships he can heal my sin and he can also heal my guilt he can heal my guilt. Many of us, myself included, don't struggle nearly as much with the concept of the, of the forgiveness that we experience through Jesus. We struggle with the guilt that remains after experiencing that forgiveness. We, feel, we, we just feel bad. We feel awful. We feel like we betrayed God. We recognize how we've hurt other people, and that just stays with us, and we don't feel good enough, and we feel like people are still judging us, and maybe even rightfully so. Maybe we're judging ourselves, and we carry around with us this burden of guilt like we're still committing the sin that we've already been healed from. And if that's where you are this morning, I want you to know there's hope. Because not only can Yahweh Rofi heal my sin, he can also heal the guilt that Satan tries to heap on me. If you go to the book of Psalms, and you read in Psalm 6, David's the author, and we don't know exactly when David wrote this, we don't know exactly the circumstances behind it, but he writes a song of just, of just grief because of his own actions. Because of choices that he's been making. And he says in verse 2, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. He goes on in verse 6 and says, I am worn out from crying. David is in agony because of the guilt that he's feeling from his own choices. It's weighing him down and he's exhausted. Because that's what guilt does to us, folks. It drains us. It burdens us. It weighs us down. It robs us of joy and peace. Earlier this summer, one of, uh, our, one of the families from our church family, the Holderbaums, Mark and Alicia Holderbaum, moved to um, Carthage, Missouri. And we had a whole bunch of folks that helped load up their moving truck. And then uh, my wife, Christy, and I went with them to Carthage to unload the moving truck. And we got to the end of the day. And it's just because we've been lifting and carrying and putting down all day long, and just it felt like every muscle in my body was cramping. That's just how out of shape I am. That has nothing to do with anything else, but just, I, and I'm not kidding. Like, we're driving from Carthage, Missouri, back 
back to Rogers, and I've got my hand on the steering wheel, and just close my hand like that. I start getting a cramp in my arm, like, ah, I can't let go of the steering wheel, and just my hands. And then, you know, we're checking in with our boys at home, and, and I'm calling on the cell phone, and my hand is cramping, out like, it was awful. It was just awful. I'm, I'm having all these cramps, and I'm, and I'm sore, and I was sore for the next week. I know that's bad. Make fun of me all you want to. But the thing was, I wasn't carrying around the furniture anymore. I wasn't lifting and carrying anything anymore, but I was still experiencing pain from what I'd already done. Guess what guilt does to us? We make a choice. It's the wrong choice. It's sinful. We say words. We, we do things. Whatever it is, we commit sin. We beg for forgiveness. God forgives it. We're set free from it, but I'm still experiencing pain. Not from the sin itself, from the guilt that I'm still carrying. Does that make sense? And I want you to understand. I want you to trust and to know, my God, Yahweh Rofi can heal that. He can take away that guilt if I'm willing to let go of it. He'll heal me from it. I may not be making the choices I used to make, but if I'm still experiencing pain in my heart, emotional pain, even physical pain, because of my guilt, my God can heal it. He says so in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, the author of Hebrews says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences that from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Do you understand? I mean, that's kind of a long verse. Do you understand what he's saying there? Do you see what he's saying about our God? My, my God, Yahweh Rofi, the Lord who heals, can not only heal my soul of sin, he can heal my heart of guilt so that I can be free to serve him and do what he's called me to do. I don't have to carry my guilt anymore. I don't have to keep experiencing the hurt of the choices that I've made in the past because the Lord who heals has already healed it. So let him do it. Give it to him. Quit holding on to it. The Lord can heal my physical body. He can heal my relationships. He can heal my sin. He already has at the cross. And he can heal my guilt if I'm willing to let him. I don't know everybody's story here this morning. I don't know what all you're going through. I don't know what all you've been through in the past. But I do know we, we share a common problem. We live in a fallen, broken world. And things, we do things that are, that are against God's will for our lives. And things are done to us that we have no control over. And we experience hurt, we experience pain, and we experience sin. And we can look at, at our world and our own lives and just be completely depressed if we want to. Which is how bad things are, how bad I am, how bad the people around me are. And I want you to hear me this morning. As bad as things are, as bad as things can get, we still have the Lord who heals. And He can heal whatever is broken in your life. He can fix it. I want you to trust that. I want you to know that this morning. And I want to wrap up with this thought. Of all the stories of healing in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, whenever somebody was healed by God, whenever somebody was healed by Jesus, in all those different examples, not one single time did the person who was being healed ever have to heal themselves first before they went for healing. You may be thinking to yourself, well, duh. Think how, how odd it would be. All those stories of healing with Jesus, with blind people calling out his name on the side of the road, with people who are lame being brought to him, with people who are possessed by demons, who, who, who Jesus has cast them out with a word. Of all those different experiences of Jesus healing people, not one time did Jesus say, okay, first you need to go figure out how to see, and then I'll cure your blindness. Learn how to walk to me, and then I'll, I'll make you whole. I'll take away the lameness. You figure out how to get all those demons out of you, and then I'll heal. It, it, that wouldn't even make sense, would it? And yet, that's what we try to do. 
That's what we convince ourselves we must do. That I've got something broken in my life. I've got something that's hurting. I've got something that's affecting my heart, my relationships, my faith. And I've got to fix it before I come to Jesus. I've got to get my act together first. And then I'll come to him. It's backwards. It doesn't make sense. Jesus said himself in Mark chapter 2 and verse 17, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. There's not a single one of you that will go to the doctor and the doctor say, okay, well, go fix it first and then come see me again. Set another appointment. You wouldn't go to that doctor anymore. So don't do that with our God. There's some of you here this morning. Something's broken. Something's not working like it should. It's your marriage. It's your parenting. It's a friendship. It's your faith. It's your addiction. Whatever it is, it's got a hold of you and it's broken. It's not, your life's not working like it should. Don't leave here convinced you've got to go fix it first. And then you're welcome here. You are surrounded by a bunch of broken, flawed people, myself included. The difference is, at least for some of us, we trust in the healing that the Lord gives. We've trusted that he can heal, and we, we believe he has healed us. We believe he's probably going to have to heal us again. If there is anything in your life that you're holding on to and convincing yourself you've got to take care of. Satan's lying to you. Don't listen to him anymore. We're going to stand together in just a second. We're going to sing a song about coming to God just as we are. Broken, sick, bumps and bruises and all. Just as I am, I'm coming so that you can make me well. If there's anything in your life that's broken, we want to pray with you and for you and do whatever we can to help you experience the healing from the Lord who heals. Don't be embarrassed. Don't hesitate to share. We want to help if we can. Walk together, we stand and sing.